So I thought uh, before we get into the session and what the Tea Party wants, I thought we'd talk about the elections and what the Tea Party got, or maybe what the conservative movement got, because I know there's some disagreement about what falls under the umbrella of, of Tea Party. Uh, Senator-elect Burton, Senator-elect Betancourt, from the Senate's perspective, it was probably a, a, a good election cycle for the Tea Party. You got a lieutenant governor you wanted, and you have a number of people who departed who by reasonable estimates were less conservative than the people who are coming in, beginning Senator-elect Burton with you. So it was a pretty good election cycle as far as that goes. I, I think so, and many in the, in the uh, grassroots feels that way as well. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. We think we're going to do great now, things in the Senate. The yeah. Evan, I'm trying to understand the question. It's, you know, Connie conservative, Wendy Davis liberal. Is that what you're trying to drive? Well, uh, yes, and I'm wondering if you consider yourself a liberal or conservative replacement for Dan Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> How, well, do I, how do I calibrate that along the spectrum? We'll, we'll split hairs on that after we get out of litmus test. But okay, it would yeah. take about yeah. 100 different but you But you would agree from the conservative perspective, the, the change outs in the Senate, it's a net positive for the Tea Party Absolutely. or the conservatives? Yeah. No question. Yeah. And, and I think we're in a great position, uh, Connie and I, as well as with the returning members, to actually implement conservative solutions to Texas challenges. Right. And for, uh, for a, a, a tax guy, I'm looking for, obviously, for property tax relief. I think there's a, a wide uh, agreement on securing the border and what we're doing, yep. probably the best $86 million we've spent. Uh, we'll take a look at that uh, once we get back more statistics. But I think that there's a strong movement to use uh, you know, good public policy and take these conservative wins yeah. and turn them into conservative public well, policy. Well, and we'll talk about issues in a second. I want to acknowledge that here in Austin, as the governor uh, of our state, current, current governor, refers to as the blueberry in the tomato soup, the Senate seemed pretty conservative last time. You felt like it was not adequately conservative that you all had to add reinforcements this time. That's right. Well, I wouldn't consider Wendy Davis conservative. But the Senate as a body, you would agree, last session, did produce conservative results. <clears throat> um, yes, there were some conservative things that got through, that got through but um, we're looking for more. Um, you want more? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, and, and But more importantly, you know, it was... I'm, you know, in Senate District 10, and those of us in, in Senate District 10 wanted a more conservative um, senator. And um, well, you got one. Well, yeah. I get you got one. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Stickland, you were famous for uh, uh, using the phrase "in private and in public, we're coming back and bringing friends" with right. regard to the House, <laughs> and with regard specifically to the Tea Party Caucus in the House. You all wanted to expand your numbers. Now, I've joked with you after the election that you brought back enough friends, maybe to fit in my Land Rover. Right. That it wasn't necessarily the, the victory to the extent that you wanted, but you've challenged that. You actually think that on Election Day you did bring back quite a few friends. We did, and we, and we did so with pennies on the dollar. Uh, where the conservatives played in legitimate races, our message won overwhelmingly. Um, it wasn't just the new people that we brought back to, folks like myself and Matt Schaefer, who experienced uh, you know, massive resources against us, smashed our opponents. And I think the statewide sweep that we saw from the conservative movement is absolute proof that our messaging is what the voters require of us. Right. Ha, ha, what would you put, put, put a number, and I understand this is not an exact science, put a number on the number of friends that you brought back where the number of people who will be going into the session next time add to the numbers you had last time. What's the net gain in the House, would you say? In the House, I, I think we're between 8 and 11. Between 8 and 11, which would put the total number of people who you feel <clears throat> in sync or aligned with kind of walking as a, as a group, what would you say, 35? I, I would say between 40 and 45. You would even go higher, 40 yes. and 45. Well, one of the people you brought in with you, one of those friends is Mr. Yeah. Mr. Rinaldi, who beat uh, Representative Ratliff in the primary. You had attempted to beat him before, were unsuccessful the last time. What was the difference from that time to this time? Well, I think the difference was my opponent had a record. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I think you need to focus on is in the races where we were challenging incumbents and were, were vastly outspent, we were very successful. The few disappointments we had in the runoff elections came in open races where none of the candidates had records right. and the, the so-called moderate candidates were campaigning on the same issues that we were. So they were campaigning on conservative values, on conservative issues, and they won. So the mountain came to Muhammad in the cases where you did not prevail. And in some ways, that's a victory, I suppose, because now they've campaigned on your issues. And if they get back in the legislature, they've got to carry your issues. Exactly. Yes. And, and, and that's a very important point that Matt yeah. made. No one won an election in the state of Texas in the Texas House running as a moderate. Every single one of them was a hardcore conservative and would have loved to be in a panel like this before the voters went and voted. 
Now, Representative Lee, do you feel, as Representative Stickler does, that the gains you made were adequate to the tasks you have before you, politically and from a policy standpoint? Well, I think the point you're trying to get at is... Uh, I haven't said the word speaker's race yet. I will. Heads up. But we know. I'm speaking uh, more than <laughs> We know. I resisted uh, using speaker's race in the title of this sure. panel, but we'll get Well, to well look, the, the point is that, that the people of Texas have spoken. Uh, the people of Texas, both in the primaries and in the general election, have have told us as the legislature, not just Republicans, Tea Party people, but Democrats as well, the people of Texas have told us what they want us to do. And that's to come to Austin and to limit government, to protect the Constitution, to uh, secure the borders, uh, to come up with free market solutions to the problems facing our state. And now it's our obligation and our opportunity and our duty to respond over the next 140 days, and hopefully no more, um, to, uh, to give the people of Texas what they've asked for, what they expect, and most importantly, what they deserve. Do you, do you think that requires uh, in the legislature leadership that affirms that perspective? Because I'm walking very gently to this topic. <laughs> in, in the Senate, uh, Senator-elect Burton, Senator-elect Betancourt will have the benefit from the Tea Party perspective of somebody who they are absolutely aligned with in Dan Patrick as Lieutenant Governor. In your case, maybe not so much. You don't have to dibble dabble. You can just say, let's talk about okay. speaker's race. Right. <laughs> are, are, are you going to be able to win this thing, or is it going to quickly pivot to it's not about the vote on January 13th, it's about the agenda? for the 140 days? Well, there's no question that uh, what happens on January 13th largely impacts and affects the agenda over the next 139 days after that. But I think our focus as legislators not a, doesn't just need to be on January 13th. Um, it needs to be on what specific policies are we going to be focused on and what are we going to do to advance the principles um, of freedom of li and liberty in Texas. And um, look, I am supporting Scott Turner for speaker. I have known... You have, um, and you haven't wavered in that at all. I have not wavered in that at all since the day that uh, Representative Turner announced for speaker, speaker. I've been a faithful and excited supporter of his. I'll tell you that there's probably no member of the Texas House that's as close to Representative Turner as I am. We've been friends for a number of years. We lead a Bible study together at our church. We share Collin County together. I know Representative Turner, and I think Rep Representative Turner would be a tremendous leader for the Texas House. Now, having said that, um, this morning, I sat down with Speaker Strauss for 30 minutes, and we had a wonderful conversation focused not on January 13th, but focused on day two through 140, talking about specific policies that I'm passionate about and that are important to my district, and talking about how uh, we can focus on those things um, uh, during sessions. So um, come what may on, on January 13th. You're not calling the race. The, no. the, the fact no. that you went to see the speaker is not an indication that you're calling the race before it. No, before the not moment. at all. In yeah. fact, the speaker, uh, Speaker Strauss, to his credit, um, back before I was even sworn in in 2013, um, I, I had the opportunity to ask Speaker Strauss, what's your advice for an incoming freshman? And he gave me a piece of advice that I think is important for all of us. I've never forgotten it. He said, vote your district. Vote your district. Do, in a sense, do what you said you were going to do when you were running. And that's important for all of us to remember. Right. Because, uh, look, January 13th is going to be a tough vote, but there's going to be several hundred tough votes that come after that. And it's important for us to stay true to our principles right. and to uh, focus on our districts. Agree? Yes, I agree. I think part of the problem is is that we've we've made this into a huge deal. That I, I, Who's I we? Well, frankly, the media and, and the grassroots and, and a number of different people have made this into something that it's not. What I have been saying is, at the end of the day, this is a vote. This is one vote. You're going to take thousands more. Right. right now, as it stands, Joe Strauss has as much power as any one of us up here on the stage. We are going to give that to him on January 13th if he is the victor. But at the end of the day, this is just a vote. Yeah. And it's not the end of the line. Um, it doesn't mean if we're not successful that we're going to give up or that we're going to stop fighting. Right. Uh, it just means we have to relook at our strategy. So I, I think part of the reason that this has become such a deal is because there's such a long time period beforehand before we have to take the vote. Right. But let me tell you, we got we got to vote on some very serious things right after that vote is taken. Beyond that, you know, uh, Senator Lake Burton and, and Betancourt, it's assumed that this is only a matter for the House. But the reality <laughs> is, leadership matters on both sides, to both sides, because what happens in the Senate moves over to the House, and so who is the House leader ultimately affects the work that you've done in, in the Senate. Would you agree? Well, but what you're hearing is the conservatives are going to get together in conservative public policy. Right. And that's what's going to get passed in this next session. Now, we have a great advantage because we do have Dan Patrick as our leader in the Senate. Yep. And Dan has been very outspoken in his campaign on border security, property tax relief. You can go down the list because right. he said it in the Tribune and everywhere else. 
Now, when those get passed, uh, there will be no doubt in my mind that all the conservatives in the House will join the conservatives in the Senate and trying to pass that legislation. Hmm. And because these are things that the, the, that the entire body politic in Texas knows that are coming. Yep. They, they know that border security is, is an issue. They know property tax relief is an issue. We get a property tax relief bill out of the Senate, um, I would be shocked that the, regardless of the leadership in the House, that, that the conservatives, the Republicans, which are almost in a supermajority, wouldn't adopt it. Right. Um, and I think that's the common sense. That's what's really going on on the ground at this point in time. Uh, Senator Lake Burton, you don't need Speaker Turner for this to be a conservative session. The metrics for victory of a conservative session don't require that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, regardless of who the, the House chooses as Speaker, I think we're going to do great things with conservative le legislation because, again, right. as everybody has said, that's what the people of Texas has, has um, yeah. shown us uh, with these elections. That just came but before we get into the specific issues, because I do want to drill down into what a conservative session looks like from a policy standpoint. One can imagine the legislature or the state really as a third, a third, and a third. Not a one-party state, not a two-party state, but a three-party state. A third Democratic, a third Tea Party, and a third mm. traditional Republican. Now you could fudge those numbers and say, well, it's actually more Tea Party and less traditional Republican. But if you look at the legislature, if you're talking about 45 or 50, and you're talking about 15 to 18 in the Senate, you're looking at somewhere in the vicinity of a third of the total body is kind of with you guys. About another third are non-traditional uh, Tea Party Republicans, more kind of establishment Republicans, and maybe a third de Democrat. How do you regard the other two camps, Mr. Rinaldi, going into the session? Mm -hmm. Do you look to the Democrats to work with them against the Republicans who maybe don't see the world as you do? Do you work with the other Republicans against the Democrats? How do you, how do you play that chessboard? Well, I mean, I, I, I think you have to try to work with everybody to find common ground where that common ground exists. I you mean, think you would have common ground with both groups? I think you would have common grounds on different issues with right. different groups. For example, yeah. I, would look, I, I would look to the Democrats in the chamber on, on Fourth Amendment privacy issues and see where we agree on those issues and see where we can work together. I would look to uh, moderate establishment Republicans to see where we can work together in implementing Greg Abbott's agenda that, that he campaigned on and won right. overwhelmingly on. Right. So it, it depends on the issue. Yeah, but, but, but Evan, when you go to the discussion of what the issues are, yeah, look at the. Uh, I mean, the first debate that's really a non-debate is: is the budget going to pass with a spending cap being busted? And the answer is clearly no. Well, in mm -hmm. fact, even the okay. speaker has said he doesn't believe that the spending right. cap right. should be busted. So, so a lot of this debate has already occurred in the elections because people have discussed it, they've talked about it. Right. So there'd be, you know, to all, everybody here, Connie, and like if it was Van or Don or any of the other freshman senators, there's no expectation level that anybody in their district is asking them to vote to bust the spending cap. Right. So that's one issue that is effectively already been effectively in the rearview mirror. Right. Now, border security, uh, you know, it's $86 million. Yes, we can afford it and we're gonna to continue to budget that. I don't think any of the, of the Republican camps that I know of are disagreement with that. Um, and uh, you know, I hope the same is true for property tax relief and on down the line. So maybe the sense of there being two Republican parties or Republican parties at, at war, maybe again, to Representative Stickland's point, the media does all this stuff. Maybe we're the ones who are actually exaggerating or, or, or creating that expectation that there's a fight when there's not that much of a fight. No, I, I think there is a fight. What, I, what I'm pointing out is, is that... <laughs> I was trying to give it to you there. You know? Exactly. <laughs> My point is, is that they don't act like there's a two parties within the Republican Party during the primary. And that's the frustrating thing. When we come to Austin for six months out of the two years, that's when we see the true division. Yep. Because that's when some of these folks are working against what they campaigned for. Yeah. and are being dishonest to the people back at home. Right. But when we go back and it's time to vote and we're standing before the voters, there is no difference between my website or a mailer that I would send out and anyone over in this other camp that we're fighting in Austin. Right. And that's what I feel like is dishonest. That's why my, one of the things I've been talking about this session is I want this session to be about going on the record. Right. I want this session to be about no longer are we going to look to leadership to hide us from tough votes or try and skirt around it. We right. owe it to the people of Texas to, to tell them with our vote where we actually stand on the so issue. So one metric of success for this as a conservative session, Representative Leach, would be 
total openness and transparency about where people stand on issues? Well, I don't think that's a conservative issue. I think that's a Texan issue. That's what Texans expect and right. deserve. From the Democrats should want that as well. Absolutely, and I think it's an important point to note that when we, on day one, all labels are dropped. It doesn't matter whether you're Tea Party, Republican, Democrat, liberal, from West Texas, East Texas, from the, right. from the Metroplex, Houston, wherever it may be. I mean, our business is to do the, the business of the people of Texas. Now, if it becomes about what's going to help us get reelected or what's going to help us raise more money from the lobby or what's going to make leadership happy, I mean, if that becomes our focus, then we've lost our focus. Our focus is to serve the people who sent us there. And uh, there were a number of bills last session and a number of bills going into th this session. I know I can speak for Representative Stickland and I, where we worked with Democrats hand in hand on uh, whom we may disagree with on a number of issues. But if we can find an issue, and there are those issues that we do agree on, man, we work passionately together uh, getting those pieces. But of let me add something to Representative yeah. Leach's comments. There's also been some historic changes in the election from the standpoint, look at the results. You see Greg Abbott, you see Dan Patrick winning the majority of Hispanic male votes. With a, with a very clear board security message, was very unambiguous, but yet he still got the majority of votes. Now, that gives you a chance to not just do conservative solutions for Republican politics, but to do conservative solutions for Texas politics. Mm -hmm. right. Because I believe the body politic, not just the Republican Party, independents and Democrats, they're looking to see whether this legislative session is going to pass real solutions. And I believe with the type of energy we have coming in with eight new Republican freshmen, the senators, as well as uh, several other friends in whatever size car you, you allow them, that's going to be a lot, of, a lot of energy to getting those conservative bills passed. Yeah. Let me start then on the substantive piece of this with Senator uh, uh, Burton, uh, Senator Betancourt, Senator Lake Betancourt has mentioned the budget a couple times. It does seem to be a general agreement, spending cap is a spending cap. Some people may complain about it, but it is what it is. Beyond that, you get through this session, what does a conservative budget look like to you? What's in it, what's not in it? From a revenue standpoint, from an expense standpoint, define success for us. Build the budget. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as the whole budget is concerned. Well, just no, give, I, give, give us your well, core principles as far as the right, budget goes. Right. What would be a successful I mean, conservative it, budget? For instance, I mean, some of the things that I'd like to see done are um, zero-based budget, budgeting implemented. Um, I want to get rid of the business margins tax. Get um, rid of it, not, not tweak it. Right. End it, don't mend it. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, but as, from a big picture perspective, you know, what I always, what, we, what I campaigned on and what the people in my district want are just a prioritization of the budget. You know, they want uh, us to focus on the core functions of, of government first and foremost, right? And, the, and those would be? And those would be education, water infrastructure, right. um, uh, uh, the border security, um, Health right, uh, you know, public safety, uh, right. you know, those kinds of things. Those are what are the core functions of state and government. We, and to your mind, and Senator elect, we have enough money in the budget to cover those core priorities. We should, yes, yes, absolutely. And what happens is so many of the times other things are, are dealt with first and foremost, and then um, the things of core functions of government are dealt with after everything else is funded, and, I, and we want a prioritization You want to re that. reverse absolutely. that. But Ms. Absolutely. Mr. Rinaldi, do you think that you can accomplish everything you need to in a fast-growing state with enormous challenges with the revenue that we have currently? Uh, yes, making adjustments for real growth, and I mean, for, the, for keeping the real size of government the same, you absolutely can. Right. So you're still, you're still increasing the size of, uh, the, uh, the, of the budget by population plus inflation. Yeah. Um, so you're still accounting for that growth. What I think we need to do is I think we need to, one, uh, come up with a real spending cap, not, not tied to right. GDP, tied to, in, tied to inflation plus population growth. I think the second thing we would look for in the budget is, as Connie said, to prioritize those important uh, items of infrastructure, transportation, water, education, um, and, and prioritize those in the budgeting process. And third, uh, uh, governor, soon to be Governor Abbott campaigned on it. I think we need to come up with a new spending cap, a new constitutional spending cap that's not tied to GDP and is tied to inflation. Plus now population. he's asked, uh, General, -elect, uh, General Abbott, Governor Elect Abbott has talked about something like, a, if I read the Dallas Morning News properly last weekend, about a billion three in, in, new sp in, in spending, but he also wants to jimmy with the money that we're spending now to accommodate those additional requests. So it's okay to you in your mind to spend money, more money on some things, but right. as long as you pay yes. for it within, exactly. within the current expense footprint of the right. state. But, but I think there's one thing that we would all agree, and I think what the body politic is interested in, Evan, yeah. is that 
they're tired of hearing about spending priorities. They want some form of tax relief. And so that's, that's top of your list. Uh, no, given your history, not, not a big surprise there. Well, but it's also Lieutenant Governor Patrick has campaigned on it. Right. You know, from, so uh, define property tax relief for this audience. What, well, what, what does it look like? Uh, you know, property tax relief would be as values go up, tax rates come down. Or exemptions go up, uh, either for homes and businesses. Uh, we can also talk about hard revenue caps and, and, and points that the representative made because when you have an 11.68% increase in your cap because of personal income, that's, that's still substantially above an inflation and population marker over by a factor of about two right. and a half to one. How much of that property tax, you know, simple-minded people like me assume that property taxes are really dealt with at the local level, that it's not really a state issue. Representative Leach, how much can you really do on property taxes <laughs> at the Capitol? Well, we'll find out um, <laughs> during this next session. I think uh, Senator-elect Betancourt is right that the, uh, whether it's property tax relief, franchise tax relief, I've also filed a bill to completely uh, get rid of to phase so out. So you're also end yeah. it, you're in the end it, don't mend it camp on the on the market. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Texas is, is known as a business-friendly state. We say we're open for business. Businesses are fleeing here from other states. And, but we are 38th out of 50. I think the latest numbers I read, 38th out of 50 in terms of business. Uh, right. tax status among the other states. If we were to get rid of completely our franchise tax, we would instantly become number one. Let, and so my, my, my focus right. is on franchise tax relief, property tax relief. Are you going to replace that revenue in the budget that you're cutting from the business tax and from the property tax with anything? Because we may be number one in, in the business environment, but I'm not sure we can open the school doors. Okay, but let me, let me, let me talk about the insidious part of school yeah. finance, right. okay? And because here's how school doors really get open. Yeah. As local property taxpayers pay more, the state pays less. Yeah. And this last budget cycle, it was about a two and a half billion dollar Robin Hood credit, is what I call it. I call it Robin the Hood because Robin the Hood. Robin the Hood because if you live in Austin ISD or Houston ISD, you're paying four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars more this year alone in taxes, and the state then gets the break of being able to pay less. So. We're going to have at least $4 billion in what I call a Robin Hood backup that can be used for property tax. To, all, to, to, to put it on top sure. of whatever. Sure. Right. So, Representative Stickland, would you say a property tax and business tax cut would be a requirement for you to think this was a successful for conservatives this session? I think so. But, you know, for, for me, too, I also throw in some spending cuts. I think there's some very... Cuts. Okay, yes. name them. Let's go. I think we need serious criminal justice reform in the state of Texas. I think there's a lot of money. What, what, what would you cut in criminal justice? I, I am sick and tired of, of paying thousands and thousands of dollars for nonviolent criminals to be locked up. I think we need to focus more on rehabilitation as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, to locking people up. I think we need to punish the wrongdoer instead of putting people away that we're afraid of. So I think there's a lot, a lot of reform in that area. I think we spend too much on health and human services. What would I, you cut in health and human services? Oh, quite a bit. Well, go ahead, name it. Well, I, I, you know, I have a problem with putting braces on children whose uh, adult teeth haven't come in yet, things like that. Um, I, I think we need some serious reform. We have gotten into this idea that health care is some kind of constitutional right. And, and I, I don't necessarily think that it is. Right. So do you, do you I'm think, not saying cut it all out. Well, well, but let's, but when let's, you look at the growth of health yeah. and human services spending in this state, that is what we're competing with when we're talking about education Well, dollars. and in fact, Chairman Zerwas was on the panel before this one and was talking about how the cost of health care all in at the moment has now risen to meet the cost of education Patient, and right. will go past it. Right. And the so, two are 80 percent of the total amount of budget. It, it, indeed. So let's stay with, since Representative Stickland very kindly brought health care up, let's talk about health care. We live in a state that has the most uninsured people of any in the country, the highest percentage and the highest raw number. Uh, you all, people who preceded you in your seats, and some of you all have said, we don't like what's coming out of Washington, peace. Elections have consequences, I get that. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of doing what's being offered to you, what will you do meaningfully to solve the problem? How do you get costs under control? What are the policy things you all push, conservative policy things, this session? I think in general, most of us would agree that the reason that health care access and costs have gone up um, is because government has been involved. And none of us up here want Texans to have less health care. We want them to have more. We just disagree with the approach that government is the answer. Right. I don't look at government as, as the one who has the ability to bring down the cost. When we throw in red tape and we put all these requirements in, right. that, is, that is what's driving so, it but, up. But practically speaking, and I'll throw this open to anybody, practically speaking, assuming Representative Stickland is right, what do you do? What do you as the legislature do next session 
since you've got the votes theoretically to do whatever you want, what do you do? Well, what you start do by doing, and, and Senator Burton has talked about it, is you, you look, look at every budget, you do a zero-based budgeting analysis on every department. You also have to look at major sunset legislation because health and human services are undergoing a huge complex reorganization where uh, Kyle Janik is going to end up with 56,000 employees in one state agency. You have to look at your best practices. You have to adopt best practices from other states. And in, it's not just a one-year, one legislative session fix. You want to look and set good targets and bring in best practices from other states in business and industry. And, and, and that's something that hasn't yet to happen with yeah. all the conservative movement and all of the Republican domination of politics. There's right. not been a analytical, let's go take a look at every state, uh, every departmental budget. I believe uh, Chairman uh, Jay Nelson is actually doing that for the first time as the Senate Finance Committee. Right. So there's a lot there to go look at. And the conservatives are effectively from Missouri. Show me. Show it to me. But understand right. you need extra money, what is it that you need, and give us some data that we can understand why that's good. Because there are good investments in government. Uh, you know, actually, Jonathan talked about a couple of them. So we're open-minded to that, but we want to see the real budgeting process begin. And it starts with having accountability in every state agency. Representative Lee, this, this uh, uh, begs the question of why you all, if the things that Senator-elect Betancourt are talking about make sense, why haven't you done them before? You've had a conservative majority, or a Republican majority at least, in the legislature since 2003. You had Speaker Craddock and then Speaker Strauss. You've had a, a, a Republican lieutenant governor. If it was as simple as doing the things he's saying, where have you guys been for the last 10 years? That's a great question, um, and, I, and I agree. And uh, the, the, the point is, is that we are uh, we're coming into a legislative session. We have tremendous opportunities, especially when you talk about health care. One of my areas of concern is um, just a shortage in, doc shortage in doctors statewide. We uh, pay a lot of money at the state to send our kids to medical school, our public university medical schools across the state, and many of them are leaving to go practice medicine in other states. Uh, we've got to reverse that trend. You talk about one area, sure, we need to cut in many areas. I think actually one area where we need to look at increased funding is, for, is to keep more residencies here in the state to ensure that we've got the doctors to increase competition, to provide more access to care. That's going to help us drive costs down. And that's not necessarily a conservative or a liberal issue. That's just one that maybe is a good investment. I think it's a, it's a, a practical, common sense, good public right. policy issue. Right. Yeah. It's an everybody issue. Right. Right. Absolutely. Now, Senator like Burton. Can, can and, I yeah, I'm sorry. Can I address sure. what you said? Because I, I, I want to add something here. Part of the reason that we have not seen the conservative <clears throat> agenda, you know, go, me and you have talked offline about actual solutions, okay? We get accused very often of being the party of no, if you will. And the problem is, is that we have spent so much time saying no to things that our party has been pushing for. The amount of time that we had to spend on stopping some of our colleagues from our side of the aisle on their wishes to expand Medicaid we haven't gotten to the point where we've been able to. And do you and think now you have critical mass where you can start talking about that? If not, they're going to have to start answering to the people. We have won the rhetoric war. The people of Texas have spoken. Yeah. And it's getting harder and harder for them to, uh, you know, arrange some of this stuff back in the back hallway. Let me ask Ms. Burton and Mr. Rinaldi. This, this uh, fall, the Beaumont Enterprise newspaper, Beaumont is still a conservative community, more conservative certainly than Austin. <laughs> said that you all ought to look at taking some money from Washington under the Affordable Care Act just at least for the next two years, because otherwise you're leaving it on the table. If you elect a Republican president in 2016 and the Affordable Care Act is either repealed or defunded or what have you, worry about that then, but at least for now, take some money and do something. I don't expect that you agree with that, but it does raise the question of whether you ought to at least be talking to Washington. Should the affect of Texas be talk to Washington, negotiate, compromise, try to get the best deal you can, or should it be talk to the hand? Ma'am. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, when, when, when here, well, let, me let, think, here, uh, let me get a hand up for you. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I think Ronald Reagan put it best when it comes to dealing with the government and the federal government in particular. If you get in bed with the government, you're gonna get more than a good night's sleep. <laughs> and that tends, to be my, <laughs> that tends to be my view okay. of it. So, so, so talk to the hand. Uh, I, that's your word, not mine. But but yes, I don't think I don't think any good can come of negotiating with the federal government over federal government money, which will be not temporary. just health care, but any other money. No, no. It's, it's, it, some money is. I mean, the way it's structured right now, that just isn't a reality that you can right. forego all right. government money. But in this right. instance, you can't. 
Well, I was just going to say, um, the, the people in my district are so frustrated and disgusted with the federal government and its overreach into into Texas um, that no, I, and and they don't they don't want um, national health care. Um, they don't want that. So my answer. But would they don't be even no. want you talking to the to, to the program. That is correct. That is correct. Um, yeah. And and <clears throat> I've campaigned the whole time on you know if we don't get back to the Tenth Amendment and Texas um, developing solutions for Texas instead of the federal government forcing right. their wishes down on us. I mean that that's what's going to um, get things moving in the right direction. But to go back to the cuts, um, and it's a controversial one, I realize, but I am a free market conservative. I believe in the free market, and I don't believe in the government picking winners and losers in the marketplace. And the state of Texas does that quite a bit, as a matter of fact. And those are funds I'd like to see zeroed out. So this would be the Texas Enterprise Fund? Yes, in, in addition to others as well. Now, yes. this, this is a case where your predecessor, Senator Patrick, came out during the campaign. Even Wendy Davis wasn't against getting rid of the Enterprise Fund no, completely. No. But, but Dan Patrick was. Because he's right. Because we right. shouldn't be picking winners and losers. So get rid of the enterprise fund. Well, and, and look, I'm I'm was against the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute fund because we weren't prepared to spend three hundred million dollars a year. Yeah. We we walked into a business that we knew nothing about. It was a jackknife. We've had to recover from it. The reality is that. The, the, new, the new conservatives here would all agree that we don't want to get in the business of picking winners and losers. And, um, and I'm actually very, very proud of the comments that Lieutenant Governor-elect and Governor-elect Abbott have made about it because we need to think that... Well, I don't think, that, unless I'm mistaken, I don't think Governor-elect Abbott is as far down the path of saying get rid of the enterprise fund completely. Right. But the fact that they're even having this discussion they're even at having all, the conversation. I mean, could you imagine this 10 years ago and... No, I and that And that they, they both <laughs> win a majority of the Hispanic vote? And of course, nobody could. Well, a majority of Hispanic men, not right, a majority right, of Hispanic right, vote. Right. Do you all agree that uh, enterprise funds should be eliminated? Yes, yes, yes? I agree. I yes, do. yes? Yes. Yes, I agree with one caveat. I would... Um, it certainly, at the very least, needs to be retooled and rebuilt. Some of the concerns we've been hearing about the enterprise fund and how it's been used are, are alarming at best. I will tell you, I've had conversations with CEOs, Toyota specifically, some of the executives of CEOs who have, of, of companies who have moved into Texas, and they don't really mention the enterprise fund or incentives as their reason for coming. It's nice to them, and we ought to, in my opinion... You think they would have, come, the with, you think they would the, have come without it? It's the business <laughs> policies Most that we them. have in Texas. Yes. They're choosing Texas because of the policies that we've put in place, because they realize, just like we do, that that money can be pulled at any point. They are coming here because of the conservative policies that we've put in place, those are the policies that we need to protect and focus on in the next legislative session. And you actually may find, Mr. Rinaldi, areas of agreement with Democrats after on that. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That may absolutely. be another area by bipartisan. And, 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 and if they were coming for, for uh, funds like the Texas Enterprise Fund, they would be going to New York because exactly. New York spends more than twice as much on corporate much greater welfare. incentives than other places. Yeah, absolutely. has got fantastic data online about job growth, 1.2 to 1.3 uh, million jobs. 55% uh, of those jobs are in the upper wage uh, quartiles. Uh, fantastic information on website. Go look at it right now if you want to take a look at it. And that tells I'm going to like you being in the legislature. <laughs> well, it's there, and the facts are real. Yeah. So we should recognize it. And, and one thing that we don't want to do, and I don't think any of the five of us would ever think, is we want to stay out of the way of the job creation yeah. engine. Right. Because right. government doesn't do it. It's generally best when government stays out of the way that yeah. when you right. have the success from small business right. to medium business. It goes back uh, to the priorities I was talking about. If we focus first on transportation and water infrastructure and education and public safety, they will come. Those they things are going to be the magnets right. that attract That's it. But the exactly. data is overwhelming that we are the success of the nation, so let's continue that and not replicate somebody else's failure. Well, uh, Senator-elect Burton mentions education. Let's go to education. So last session you bought back much of the cut, not the entirety of the cut, but much of the cut that you made in 2011, reduced the number of standardized tests from 15 to 5, mm -hmm. expanded the number of charters uh, approved at the, at the state level, didn't blow the cap off the charters, completely did not uh, embrace a voucher program, did expand parental choice within school districts. What's next on the agenda? Here is Chairman Acock, Chairman of the House Public Education Committee. For all we know, he'll be Chairman again next session. Direct his work. Tell him what we should do in the area of public education that would be satisfactory to conservatives. Representative. <clears throat> the, the number one thing I think we look, need to look, focus look, on. Look at him. Well, Don't and I talked to him about it. <laughs> I, I told him right beforehand, um, you know, I don't think that we are going to put more money, like, say, per kid into public education. You do, not, you do not think that this session? No, I do not think we need to. But 
What we do need to do is free up the money that our local schools do have to spend it the way that they see fit. And for the first time, you know, we, we talk about local control a lot. I can impact my local schools better in Bedford, Texas than a bureaucrat can here in Austin. Yeah. So I want to restore that trust and return those dollars to the classroom so that Hearst Hewlett's Bedford ISD can sit, spend the money the way they want to so rather you, than how us. how do you do it? We what cut the unfunded you mandates. Do? You cut the unfunded mandates. We cut mandates. unfunded mandates. Can we you free name up a couple the, of unfunded mandates? That sure, you I'll cut? give you one, one prime one. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, 21 kids per class. You have to file for a voucher if you have more than that each semester. If you moved that number to an average across the school, 21 kids per class average at the school, you could save tens of millions of dollars by, how would instantly. You, how would you save the money by doing that? How would you, be, how would you, because how, you, could, you could move around teachers, some could handle more, some would you, could. Would, would that be a means to reduce staff? Would that could be, be. Would that be how you'd be. save money? It could be, yes. Yeah. And just the fact of you know filing the vouchers and, and keeping track of it and all that stuff that has to be done every six months. Everybody else up here agree that we don't need to put more money into public education per student? What, what we need. Yes, you agree? I absolutely agree. And, and that, that isn't the key to fixing our public schools. If you look nationwide, there's no correlation between the amount of money spent per student and right. the quality of schools. I mean, you can look at Washington, D.C. versus right. Utah on that. But of course, well, our own TEA shows, based on their rankings of schools, that the exemplary schools spend on average $1,000 per student more than the schools at the bottom. That seems to me well, to be well, something now, like let, a let correlation, me correlation rather than causation. Correlation right? rather than and, causation. And let me say this. I'm not talking about, you know, population plus inflation growth. I think we you know, need to continue doing that. I believe me and, and Jeff Leach voted for a supplemental bill to restore some of the cuts that were made before right. on HB 1025 before it was changed to some but other again, stuff. But again, the so, point is not, you, don't think, the current level to, you don't think we need to spend more per student in the No, I, I think the key to making education great in the state of Texas is the innovation that only competition brings. Mr. Leach? We're going to have a great opportunity this next session, probably in a special session, maybe this time next year, to completely look at school finance in Texas. Right. And uh, that presents us a great challenge, but also a great opportunity across the state, Republicans and Democrats, to come together. I, I do not believe that the way we fund our schools statewide um, is equitable. I don't believe it's adequate. I don't believe it's right. So and you're I think with Judge ought Keats, ought to, then? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, no. It, sounded no, like fact, you were, it sounded like you were reading from his ruling. No, in fact, here's my point. Here's my point. I think yeah. that, that we ought to not, I think we ought to do this during the regular session. We ought to not wait on a judge's ruling to tell us as legislators. We don't answer yeah. to the judges. Yeah. Um, the people, we answer to the people of Texas. We ought to do that business. So if the uh, judge, well, the, let me ask you this question. This came up actually during the primary. I had a conversation with the libertarian candidate for governor. Kathy Glass, Kathy, and, I, yes. and I, said, I said, what do you do if Judge Dietz comes back and says, and the Supreme Court upholds, and you've got to do this? She said, well, if we don't agree with the decision of the courts, we should just ignore it. And I sat back and I thought, I didn't go to law school, but something doesn't sound right about that she, to me. It's okay. She got about 1.4% of the vote. Right, but okay, Mr. Leach that. got more than that, and he is a lawyer. And so I'm wondering, sure. is, your, is your belief that you don't have to follow the court's decision if you don't think that's the right thing to do? No, I don't believe that. And by the way, Judge Dietz, we're still waiting for another ruling um, um, to give us direction. I do believe that we have an opportunity before we get that ruling to take the matter into our own hands as the legislature, House and Senate, and Governor Abbott, and address the issue. And I think that that could right. impact the court's ruling. I really do. So rather than pausing, Ms. Burton, rather than pausing, which a lot of people assume the legislature would frankly do last time, waiting for a decision, rather than pausing this time and saying, you know what, we don't have to act on this because we're waiting, you would actually be proactive, as oh, Mr. Absolutely. Leach would? I, I, can I, can I uh, say one more thing sure. on that? I will tell you this, that I have, have over the past several months since we last, um, uh, since during in the interim, I've met with teachers, with parents, educators, administrators, and students. Um, uh, literally hundreds of them, and not one of them have said we feel like we need more funding in my district. Right. Ms. There Burke, are other concerns. Same, I, actually, I, there was there was one. Uh, there was All one. right, be nice. Let, Come on, you'll get they, your I chance. To get, you'll get your chance. No, well, here, 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 anybody from Collin County here, speak Evan, up. They right. have other other more substantial concerns. Right. Curriculum right. reform. Right. Uh, if you're asking me my wish list for Chairman Acock, it would be to completely ob obliterate C scope and Common Core in our schools, to right. continue to reduce testing. All right, all right, all right. Let him talk. Let him talk. 
Well, we are in Austin, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> y'all, you know what? I invite everyone here to come to right. Allen and Plano. Come to Plano. Right. Yes. 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 My neck of the woods. Um, before we open it up for questions, and we will here in about two minutes, we'll have a microphone in the front and a microphone in the back. I think you're going to have some takers. All right. um, let, me, let me ask about immigration. Immigration was an issue on which many of the successful Republican conservative candidates in this state in this last cycle campaigned on. Um, you alluded to the LBB decision to put $86 million into mm -hmm. extending border operations through August, although the drawdown of the National Guard in it's, March is, it's con right. is controversial, but that may get resolved. What else in the area of border security, homeland security, immigration ought to be conservative priorities in the next well, session? Well, what DPS is doing to put 4,000 cameras is a great solution because yeah. it's for only $250 per camera. And so for less than a million dollars, you can basically have a photo history of what's coming across the border and why. Now, those are the type of tools that you can use. And also, when you look at the stats, the interventions have dropped dramatically since we started the program from 6,100 a month, I mean a week, to about 1,500 a week. Yeah. So that program's working. So I would expect that the law enforcement element of that will continue, but the guard element will probably be put on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, because as an economic conservative, you want to see things that make a difference. And clearly, um, I've, we've seen the pictures, we've seen uh, firsthand in the Republican caucus of what those cameras provide you, and, and they give you the detail you need uh, for law enforcement, for interdiction, and for intervention. More importantly, I think that the public in Texas is demanding border security. And they see the results already as a positive. And um, while you might quibble with Representative Leach on his education side, I can tell you none of us are getting phone calls that say lessen border <coughs> security. Right. Okay. What, what else? Mr. Stickler. We have got to turn off the magnets that are attracting people here. Which are? Uh, well, you know, and, and dollar amount is not necessarily what we're talking about, but I followed a bill to end uh, in-state college tuition right. for illegal uh so this has been, the law, this has been the law of, of Texas since 2000, 2001 session. This was the issue on which, really, more than oops, Governor Perry's presidential campaign may have been impaled. That was the end of it. That was the end honest. of it right there. So you are carrying a bill, or you hope to carry a bill that would overturn in-state. Yes, Yeah. absolutely. Mr. Rinaldi, will you vote for Mr. Stickland's bill? I absolutely will vote Mr. for Mr. Leach, will absolutely. you vote for it? Ms. Burton? Yes. Mr. Betancourt? Yep, all of this is going to be looked at. The difference in 12 years, Evan, is that when you look at tuition deregulation. It's been a disaster for everybody trying to go to school, okay? Right. We need to recognize that. So if we're granting freebies to one group, we got to think about what we're granting. Well, and let me okay. actually ask that question. We haven't really touched on higher ed too much, but I do want to ask that question because my, my spider sense tells me there may be some legislation filed on this subject. Should we be re-regulating tuition, Mr. Stick? I, I, I wish the government was out of, of higher education as much as possible. Be honest with you. So your answer would be don't re-regulate. Stay where you are. I, I don't think so. Mr. Rinaldi, well, you're talking about re-regulating re public university tuition. There's a lot of, tuition. A lot of interest. Re-regulating public university public tuition. Public university yes. tuition, Be yes. Mr. Mr. Leach? Yes. Ms. Burton? Yeah, I don't have an answer on that one. You don't have one? Well, yeah. But let me say how nice it is to hear I don't know from an elected yeah. official. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mr. Mr. Betancourt. We've got to break the cycle of having inflated tuition leading to $1.2 trillion in student loans that can't be forgiven, okay, because if you get into property tax trouble, that's, not a, that's, a, that's a problem that doesn't supersede your student loan. Right. And, and then have an inflated cost of the universities. We have to look at this entire equation and higher ed and come up with a different paradigm. And the universities, of course, would say that if you re-regulate tuition, please give us back some of the money that you no longer give us from the state level to help fund university operations. And, and the conservatives might come back and say, great, we don't need to build a new giant building for every possibility to right. as well. And the because academics the you, would right. say you yeah, haven't know, built right. buildings in a long time, right. and the population of the state has grown, right. and we're bursting at the seams. Right, and then the conservative will come back and say that the more you build, the more it hits you on maintenance and operation. Look, there's a whole, there's a whole change that we need to think you're gonna about. Be a, you're going to be a tough nut to crack. <laughs> that is, that is well, my, let's see what the questions my, do my here. My conclusion. All right. Okay. Uh, we have a microphone in the back. We have a microphone in the front. This has been great fun for me, but I want to bring you into the conversation here and let's see what questions you have. We'll start right here. Ma'am. Hi, this is, I'm Grace Shemaine with the Texas League of Women Voters. We had 28% um, of Texans, I believe, voted uh, in the last election. 
and we were 50th of the states of voter participation. I was long wondering what the Tea Party perspective is on trying to improve voter turnout, if they're interested in that. And also, I'm very interested in online voter registration. And well, I was wondering what your perspective so, so is on that. So we are, I think, it's 50, I think there's some debate, 50th or 49th in voter turnout this last time. Look, one argument, pragmatically, is that low voter turnout has helped you guys, in a lot of cases, get elected. Oh. Right? Well. I'm, not I'm not suggesting that you're for low, to vote, low voter turnout. I am suggesting that indirectly you may have benefited from it. Well, I, I tell you, let's let I, Senator I, I Mike would, Burton speak I to this. I would venture to say that the reason that they didn't come out and vote is because there was nothing for them to come out and vote for. Thank well, you. that may be. Right. That may be. Yep. That may be. But, but I think we're saying the different version of the same thing, actually. If, if I could, one thing else, too. I think the election cycles we've had, both when you look at photo ID, it's a myth that, that somehow that's part of the problem. Because in Houston, which is the nation's fourth largest city, we had less than 100 out of 2 million residents the people that had problems with photo Where they were denied the, the opportunity to vote. Right. Now, and, and they're not even denied. I mean, because of the way th that federal law works, you get to vote a provisional, provisional ballot, ballot, and then there's 42 reasons right. why that can, literally, why that can be. So what, so what is the mechanism? Look, I think there's general agreement, whatever the outcome of elections are, whatever the cause and effect is, there's general agreement that more engagement right. by That's people good. is better than less engagement. So how do you we spend finally, a lot of money to see that happen. Mr. Yeah. Rinaldi, how do you solve that problem, and does the government have an obligation or an opportunity to solve that problem? Government doesn't have an obligation or an opportunity to solve that problem, but we do as, as candidates and government officials. I think the reason is that people are sick of Republicans and Democrats in government that don't do what they say they're going to yes. do. Yeah. They want to be able to okay. trust us and to speak to them as outsiders. Tell us what's really going on. So people don't turn out because they're, they're basically bummed out about their choices. Yeah, and, yes. I, and I, hear, I hear it all the time. I don't trust right. any of those people That's right. because they have been lied and dis regardless of political, where you stand right. on the issues, people feel like the process has been lying to them and that their vote doesn't matter. Okay. Mr. Betancourt. Stats. Bill White ran the most wonkish campaign for governor in 2010 ever. I right? have a hard time disagreeing with that. 42.3% of the folks in Texas voted for him. Wendy Davis got so, off substantially. About 39%. Right. right, okay. And what that means is that the more issues you have, the more engagement you have. And, and, and so, so the message right. to the Democrats is well, find the biggest nerd you possibly can and put that person up together. <laughs> well, that would certainly do better than the last election cycle. But, but here's the real message, Evan. Yeah. Look, if you're going to talk about conservative solutions, then do it for us. But more importantly, what I, what I see in the election results is simply this. When you have the top Democrat elected uh, candidates getting less than 40 percent, it's a question of what Republicans did right as well as what Democrats did wrong. Correct. Because there is no question that I look at Dan Patrick and I know just how demonstrative he was on border security. But yet, he did carry majority of the male Hispanic vote. More importantly, you see those results all the way down the ballot. Harris County was a sweep right. for Republicans, even though Bill White won it in 2010. Right. Bear County. But how much of that is straight ticket voting? A lot of it, and, and a matter. lot of us up here promote straight ticket voting. Right. Um, but it's a choice that the public has. And when they don't vote for somebody, it's obvious because when you go into the 30s, even Sadler had 40% of the vote in his race, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that, okay? That, that's, I mean, that tells you when you have your top candidates in the 30s, that's a, that's a that's disaster. All right, we have a okay. bunch of questions. I want to be sure that right. we get to the Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for Connie Burton, although Matt Rinaldi, if you want to answer, go ahead as well. Um, what is the legislature not focused on in the past specifically that you would like to see focused on in the 84th? Yeah, wh where have been the missed opportunities? Each of you name one that you've not been able to see done that you want to be see, see done next time. Ms. Burton. Oh, some good, uh, I know in, in my district, um, good conservative gun legislation, they're, that's what they're looking for, and they're, you know, and screaming th for that. That would be open carry yeah, in this case. Do you think the votes are there for open carry in the Senate? I, I don't know, but I do know that in my district, they are very vocal about that. Um, Mr. Rinaldi, what would you say would be one thing not accomplished previously that you want to get done now? I think polling has shown consistently that about 40% of the people in Texas perceive immigration to be the biggest problem facing Texas illegal immigration, and we have done virtually nothing to address it. In the so last so beyond the border security stuff that we heard talked about, what else would you be doing? I'd say border security, removing the magnets that attract illegal immigrants to the state of Texas. The Texas Tribune poll recently showed that high percentages of even Hispanic voters 
um, favor strong immigration controls. There was one question that was worded, I don't think to get this answer, that said, should all illegal immigrants be immediately deported? And a majority of Hispanics who answered the question said yes. Uh, which was shocking. A majority so of Hispanics answer, are you going to introduce in favor? deportation legislation? No, no, I'm doing it to, to, to just show you the, the, the yeah. staggering public opinion in favor of doing something for immigration. So it would be that, very well. Sir. Yes. Uh, first off, Representative Leach, not all of us are from Austin. I'm from South Lake Carroll. Uh, it's a principal there for 25 years, so uh, just for you to know that. Okay. Also, I really like accurate information, and since Texas does not use Common Core, which specific schools have you seen Common Core used? Uh, we've heard we've heard the complaint loud and clear from parents yeah. across the state. I don't know which, specific which school schools. districts. I don't know specifically. It is that it's not been adopted by the state. So I'm. I'm Are you saying that it's not see. being used anywhere in any schools in not Texas? Not that I know of. I would like to know which ones you've seen. I mean, yeah. we heard it loud and clear. I, I, if, you, if, if you look on yeah, the. Yeah, parents are showing me that. We, we, it's we it's actually on the, on the websites and some so of the schools. So you're you all district. are hearing from parents and schools right. that they are right. using Common Core. Sure, that's it. Yes. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll show you on the website of one of my school districts when we come down. Ma'am. Yes. Yes. I live in San Antonio, Texas, and I am legal. <laughs> I want to address to you about the waste of taxpayers' money by the district. I live, uh, I'm in a notice independent school district. And the school district, uh, if you complain about anything or you try to do something for your child, they give you criminal trespass charges. In one year, the district gave about uh, almost uh, 1,000 criminal trespass charges to parents. So they gave me one, so I challenged them. So they spend a lot of money, waste of taxpayers' money, and they are abusing the power. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, let me ask that, let me frame that into a question. Do you think that school districts are, the money, and there's a lot of talk about giving more money per student or more money to school districts, but there is a line of argument that the money that districts are getting now is not necessarily being spent efficiently right. or wisely. Right, Chairman Adcock knows this. We've got yeah. a weighted average daily attendance formula that basically governs what happens in school districts mm -hmm. from a funding perspective. Right. Now, there's five main students, but we have effectively six million virtual students in the funding formula because a pregnant teenager is worth five times a regular teenager, and there's all sorts of other ads to this. We need to get away from thinking that attendance and when you show up is everything. Okay. We have to get out of that mindset. We need to look at other formulas that get money into the classroom. You know, <coughs> I've talked about getting direct uh, expense reimbursement to teachers for audiovisual. I mean, because who right. in here doesn't know a teacher that doesn't come out of pocket 100 bucks a semester right. for right. some AV something, much less I know the forbidden cupcakes, which I hope the... But what, but what about the idea change. of shifting the focus from inputs to outputs? So rather than attendance to and graduation so, so rates or to some kind of outcome-based funding. Let's get a WADA, yeah. scrap WADA, because that's showing up. Let's get some outputs on what happens when you're there, performance-based measurements, and how and what you do to get to graduation. We need to think differently. Look, Texas is the biggest red state in the union. Let's start acting like it. Let's get, get out of the box and look at some new solutions because we've been stuck in this cycle of, of going to the Supreme Court for, what, 20 years now? Right. Chairman, I don't know how many years. It's a long time. Right. Let's get out of it because Dietz is retired, so let's think that we'll retire that funding formula and get to a new discussion in the 21st century. That will not be controversial at all, uh, I'm sure. It won't be at all, but I'll have fun with it, Evan, yes. no matter what. Ma'am. Okay. Um, I have a question about uh, where education lands in that priority list, and then um, understanding that you, know, you have local control and you have all these different needs in different places, but on a structural level, on a state level, you know, what does that look like when you start to try to communicate and connect the dots? I mean, how, what does that structure look like? Because you have to have some sort of consistency at some level for effectiveness. So is local, that's a good question. Is local control the answer to some of these issues? Because it seems, it seems like when you some. talk to people about local control, they're happy to have local control until the citizens of a community vote a way differently than they wanted. Then they suddenly go, well, we can't really allow that. Hmm. So how much local control is good? Where, where do you calibrate this? You're going to have to have top-down guidelines because right. 
what you have with the funding formulas in the in the state. There's a complex relationship between how much money people pay in her school district right. and what happens to the state budget. But of course, I'm not only talking about Mr. Betancourt about education. I'm talking about you know you've got uh, uh, people who've been advocating not successfully, but for local control votes on transportation stuff. Sure. You've got uh, the city of Denton, which voted 60-40 to ban fracking, and you know. Three Republican representatives who represent Denton County told me this week they believe in local control. They're not going to be involved in challenging the ban because the citizens of Denton have spoken. Look, is, yeah. that, is that okay to leave it to the voters on something like that, Mr. Rinaldi? I, it depends on what the issue is. Right. And in education, yeah. right. well, no, well, I mean, not, it truly does local, because, it's, no, it's no. Local what, control, depending upon the local issue, control, is that what you're saying? Local control is not a good in and of itself. It's right. good in education because it allows local school districts to effectively gauge the needs of the students in their district. Fracking is not an issue that, that exactly fits that mold. Right. Um, plus, if you have true school competition with low barriers to entry, then the local school district can then effectively compete to produce a product that can compete with private schools and, and charter schools. Ms. Burton, you would agree that a fracking ban is the wrong kind of local control? Right. I mean, if, it, if it trumps private property rights, there's a problem. I'm a strong private property um, rights advocate, so there's a problem there for me. Okay, so, if, so since we're talking about this, Christy Craddock, the chair of the Railroad Commission, told me after the election she believed that one byproduct of the fracking ban vote is that either the Railroad Commission or the legislature or both would move to effectively overturn the ban. Would you support some effort to overturn the will of the voters of Denton in that case? I support property rights. I, right. I believe that the proper role of government, the first order of business that we have, is to ensure the rights and liberties so then that's of a, our yeah. citizens. So, so you would like to yes. see the ban overturned? I, I do not want to see a city, M county, Mr. Rinaldi? Yeah. I think the law as it stands now doesn't allow that vote to to, to take effect. The law that stands... I, I think the Railroad Commission under current Texas law has the authority uh, to regulate oil and gas. I don't so think, you think I, that they'll, they'll find that the ban... I don't think we'll need to vote. Mr. Leach? Uh, I'm going to make you happy here and say I don't know. I need to uh, look into the issue I just more can't imagine that you can better. tell a private property owner that they can or cannot do something. Mr. Bettengord? Home rule cities have a wide latitude, but there has to be top-down guidelines from the legislature and what they can get involved in. Evan, I think I, going back to um, the, um, the lady's question, the question really was where does education fall in the state's priority? Yeah. State and fair. In my opinion, I think it ought to be the most important thing we do in the legislature, along with transportation and water infrastructure. Uh, we, we, look, our, our solutions to our problems with respect to health care, um, some of the other issues we're dealing with on these issues uh, that are important all relate back to getting jobs for people, growing our economy, and that starts with having a prepared, educated workforce, not just teaching our kids how to pass tests, but how to prepare them for the world. And we've worked really hard last session under Chairman Aycock's leadership, and we're going to continue to do that next session as well. I think education ought to be our one of our top three, if not our top priorities, next session. We are about to have to end, but I do want to ask one last, take the prerogative to ask one last question. We have not talked about social issues at all up here on the stage. And the fact is that the Tea Party's origins are in economic issues, not social issues, although lately in the minds of some, those lines have blurred. Do you think that social issues were adequately dealt with in the last session so that they will not come back onto the high list of agenda items this time, or are we going to see in the next session something like a redo of what we saw last session? Mr. Are Lee? you talking about the life issue? I'm talking about life. Social I'm talking about same-sex marriage. I'm talking about any, anything that would typically find its way into the bucket of social issues. Mr. Mr. Leach. Uh, on the life issue, I think there's more we can do and should do. Absolutely. Agreed? Is there agreement on that? Right, yes. but I think the likelihood of having somebody else filibuster and there become a coast-to-coast -coast celebrity and run for governor, that's probably not going to happen in the next four years. Well, I, I was less interested in the, in the filibuster than in the substance. So if, if there's stuff on the life issue that needs to be done, can you tell me what specifically you're talking about? As close to the line as we can get of complete ban of abortion in the state of Texas. So, And, yes. and, and do you think there'll be legislation introduced to do that? Yeah, I, there'll definitely be legislation introduced, and I hope it goes somewhere. I've Mr. Been... Leach, you'd be you'd be down for that? Absolutely. If we could save unborn babies, Ms. Lives, Burton, everybody's all pro-life. Yeah. So. Right, but there's not necessarily automatically agreement that we and, ought to be I moving think, Evan, in that I think direction. We also but it sounds need like to there increase is. access to adoption. Um, it, it's it's difficult in Texas for people who want to adopt children to adopt, and I think we're look, we're looking at ways. Uh, Republicans and Democrats are coming together to find ways to make it easier for parents who uh, can't have children or who want to adopt to adopt. And uh, 
So I think that's, it's not all of just about passing anti-abortion legislation, certainly we're for that, but also just uh, promoting a culture of life in Texas, and I think adoption is a big part of that. That comes back. All right, well, we're out of time. I wish we had more. Let's please thank our panelists, Mr. Stickland, Rinaldi, Leach, Benton Court, and Ms. Burton.